Chapter 10 Gold was spiritual and silver was physical, both an essential part of a broader realm of understanding. Warlock awoke the next morning, remembering the gold and every detail of his experience. He spoke about his gold to Magistro, and in response, Magistro continued to reveal his wise prophecy. You have shown your inner nature. It has come about at the chosen time. You shall never again be lonely, for every particle in existence can and will aid your powers. The power has given you the great gift of realizing your true inner self and applying it to change the world both physically and spiritually. Gold yields more energy than water and will serve you to better understand your spiritual dream world, Riddicon, on its many levels. However, do not change all your water to gold, for water aids life while gold aids development of the spiritual mind. You must maintain an adequate balance of both since water is the utmost importance as you continue to grow. Do not deprive yourself of water for the sudden spiritual burst of power from gold. Lack of water within Riddicon will lead to the death of these dreams. Understand now that gold yields the most potent influence you can imagine. However, do not use it alone because you do not have the experience to make it last in its purest form. Instead, the water will help you keep your dreams alive and sustain this gold. As you search deeper within yourself, you will realize worlds beyond the spiritual that will encompass more than what gold can touch. These things, beyond gold, are for the levels you will reach. Warlock replied, I shall use gold for its power until I find my deeper self and a more distant truth. I will not be able to use any more power than what is present in gold. I have realized that by converting the water to gold, it has lessened the amount of water I have in Sentinel Lake. I have to create more through the reins of knowledge and time. Knowledge by the way of the power's tree will create the rain to fill up my Sentinel Lake as its waves flow throughout Riddicon 2 and Riddicon 3. Magistro then said, You are now ready to hear of the past. It is the story of one such man, who you will find do have much relevance to you. Though he was not like you, you will see in time the significance of this and the importance of this in your quest. For now, take this example as a warning, so as not to repeat his mistakes. He had almost infinite power but lack of discerning stole his life. You must not let your power create a sense of arrogance, for that will destroy you in much of the same way as this man who experienced death. Heed this warning and apply it to your future works. This story will cut from your heart to your soul, much as its words can stir the hearts of Quemzon. The power speaks to me, so listen and hear your deep conscious speak and it will guide you. I'll listen to every word you utter, Warlock replied anxiously. Their significance means fulfilling my destiny. I support you, Magistro, and wish for your knowledge to be passed on so that you will have accomplished your purpose by sharing your experience with others. Don't hesitate in what you say, as I need to hear these words of warning. Though the town had shaken me, there is little now that can deter me in confidence. Your words also strengthen my beliefs. I'll build up a tolerance for oncoming danger, and so will be ready for many struggles that will come my way, both physically and spiritually. Magistro then told his story with the young warlock, enthralled by every word. The Amulet of Discerning Fifteen hundred years ago, a young man wished for more in his isolated life and was neglected by scorn. He had faith his life would improve and worked hard to make a change. He gathered wood for a master who had a sincere fondness for the man. However, the master never revealed this, so the man never realized the master's true feelings. 
As the young man sat in private, he asked the universe desperately for something different in his life. Later that day, as he gathered wood, he went deeper into the forest than he had ever gone before. It grew darker as he ventured further and became covered by the forest canopy above him. He noticed a strange red glow emanated from within the thick woods. He knew immediately that his prayer was answered as voices rustled in the air and hinted to him of his discovery. This attractive red glow became brighter with each step and soon became the only visible light. It seemed very powerful to the young man and he felt total contentment and peace for the first time in his life. The man gazed down at the ground and looked into the heart of the light. It burned his eyes slightly, but the peace he felt from it was unspeakable. The man reached down to touch the surface of what resembled a giant ruby. The young man picked up the glowing stone. There was a gold ring that met evenly with the flat gem to support it on a silver chain. As he left the forest, the amulet grew dim and brought a worry to his heart. Calmness began to fade. When his master called him, the young man hid the amulet in his pocket. For three days, he continued to work diligently for his master, continually pondering about the features of the amulet which displayed some unknown language. Being distraught on the third day, the young man squeezing the gem demanded to know the meaning of the phrase, I wish I knew what this amulet says. It emitted a bright white glow which then morphed back to red and the words changed. You may make a wish with no limits, but you must sacrifice a part of yourself equivalent to the nature of the wish. Without a trace of pain, the young man's right pinky disappeared at the granting of this first wish. Though shocked at first at the disappearance of his finger, he proceeded to make another request. I wish I had my pinky back. And so he got his pinky back. But all his hair vanished. The young man realized that energy was needed by the gem to grant the wish. Therefore, accounting for the need to consume the gem holder's body as energy for the wish. Realizing the gem's power, he realized he had no further need for strenuous labor. Much to the master's shock of this hairless man's words, the young man bid him goodbye, feeling the pressures of work disappear. The young man was tired of living with those who did not support him and made another wish. I wish I lived in my own house with no one else to bother me. This cost his right leg. A fourth request allowed him to fly, but cost his other leg. Being unconcerned about the loss of his legs, because he could fly, he made an earnest wish without thinking of the consequences. He uttered the words, I wish for all the knowledge and abilities of every person in the world, past, present, and future, as well as enough understanding to use all this knowledge. It was then that his sight was taken. Even without seeing, his knowledge allowed him to perform most any activity without hindrance. In time, he wished to see again, yet it cost him both his hands. The amulet now rested around his neck as he could not hold it any longer. He felt that even not having hands was fair because of all the material possessions he had accumulated through his knowledge. People were quick to make fun of his situation, though amazed at his ability to fly and his incredible wisdom. His next wish demanded respect from everyone, resulting in the loss of his arms. The young man was pensive about his next wish. He wanted it to be extraordinary. It took him a long time to determine what it would be and was glad when the idea finally came to him. He uttered strong words again. I wish I could have anything I want, anytime, anywhere, for any reason. He was suddenly reduced to a blind husk of a man devoid of joy. 
Now he had the bare minimum faculties required for human survival. Consciousness was all he had. Though his body could perceive sensation, he could not make any use of this feeling being the shell of a man he once was. Now being able to do anything he wanted, any time, anywhere for any reason, he wanted to try things on his own without the amulet. First, however, he knew he needed to return himself back to his usual body and senses. He dared not use the amulet now because it would have taken what he needed for survival, and then he would die. So, he trusted in his own power he obtained. He then imagined himself as an average person in the sense that all his body and senses were restored, and he retained the knowledge that he gained. He felt the amulet in his hand, and with his power, the power given by the amulet, caused it to disappear to another dimension, completely gone from his presence. For once, he felt real power. For him, the words I wish were unnecessary for, at any time, for any reason, what he wanted was done. Being scared to die, he lived a long time through the use of his power, as long as he cared to. He tried everything he could imagine, from creating to destroying worlds. After 500 years, he grew bored and tired, yet he still did not want to die. The amulet was the only thing that limited him as it was a single force that could oppose him, and he desired some challenge. Therefore, he called the amulet from its hidden dimension and attempted to challenge its power. He made wishes and used his own power to try to counter its effects. The amulet exceeded his ability, and the challenge always ended with the advantage in favor of it. The amulet had great knowledge both physically and spiritually, while the man only had experience of the physical world. The young man took a risk, thinking he could outwit this old gem. He grabbed it in confidence and uttered his final wish. I wish I had all knowledge, both physical and spiritual, in all dimensions and creations that would equal the power in wisdom with power that exceeds the amulet. The amulet itself had a limited scope, not equal to the power. The wish was beyond even the most considerable ability of the amulet. It had to gather all the power it could to grant this request. The man felt his own powers fading as they drained to give strength to the amulet. He could not reverse the unstoppable. His physical strength faded, and the man became weaker until he could no longer move. He could not think or dream as even his thoughts were being used to energize the gem. His limbs started disappearing, and his hair vanished. All his features faded and deteriorated. There was no pain until his nerves were consumed. But then the pain passed quickly because even his pain was taken to grant the wish. His body melted away and disappeared. Finally, his conscience faded. Now he was totally spiritually unconscious. His soul expired without a trace. Even with all this energy and power, the amulet could not grant the wish, so it destroyed itself and vanished from all reality. Warlock, dumbstruck, looked at Megistro's face. He had indeed been moved much more by this story than by anything else, in the nearly eleven months he had spent with Megistro. Warlock wondered how many men would have handled the amulet situation in the same manner. How many people actually think of themselves as expendable? He indeed had many questions for Magistro. Who made the amulet? Should the foolish man have known better? Such matters opened up new opportunities to be taught, showed his level of aptitude, and acknowledged his readiness to move on so he could achieve what before would have been impossible. This was so because he had not previously understood the consequences of misusing one's power. Magistro said, You must take notice of every possibility, or you shall forfeit many ideas that will cross your path. You are not being trained for submission, but for leadership, the leadership of such proportion that many leaders of today could only dream of having. Yes, I see your interpretation, 
I haven't yet met utter defeat, though I have had my lifetime's share of troubles. Hopefully I shall never taste another trying time. Do not expect what you say to happen. You must be open, like I said before, to all possibilities, and do not exclude what now seems unlikely, because it could just as easily become a reality. Indeed, times will become more trying and difficult as you train for your problems to come, which will be more complex, though all for a good cause. However, you shall never have to worry about being able to succeed, for the power that is your conscience is with you at every step of your life. Your actions will have a greater impact on the world that you could ever have hoped to dream, and you should take care and pay more attention to detail so as not to leave anything unattended. Warlock graduated to a whole new level and had much to show for his tiring exercises. He would have to learn how to search his heart deeper for answers to the more complex problems that would inevitably come his way. That night proved very interesting again because he accomplished even more than he had anticipated. He yearned to actually change the objects around the cave with his thoughts, but this proved very difficult. His mind was powerful, but he needed to learn how to channel this energy in thought form to Quemzon, in which he lived. Warlock said to Magistro, Be with me in spirit tonight, for I'll attempt an act of a new degree, like I did at Sentinel Lake of Riddicon, turning the water into gold. I now intend to affect the material items in our world of Quemzon, even more than I did with the Iron Stone. Tonight you will see a new side of yourself. It is good for you to know this part of yourself. Begin with the iron pan and use it for your creation. You can do much, and with what will be revealed tonight, you will increase your insight no less than a hundredfold. Thus, this eleventh month of training would teach Warlock much more. He rested against the outside cave wall and looked intently at the iron pan in which the fish had been cooked. The fire, having gone down, left it slightly warm. Warlock thought carefully about the clean, empty skillet. He scanned its features, imprinted them into his own mind, and focused on its very nature. He and Magistro knew then that what he would gain would allow him to influence the future generations he would encounter. He remained aware of his surroundings, not daring to let himself fall into unconscious sleep. He earnestly stared at the pan, then slowly closed his eyes and retained the image that so strongly burned in his mind's eye. As he looked at the picture within his mind, its appearance became more real, almost a counterpart to the actual pan, just as he entered Riddicon too. Was it the spiritual part of this object? It sure seemed to be because he was able to understand more of this simple object. The spiritual held more information for the taking, if only one could grasp what was presented. The surface features of this spiritual object became fuzzier as Warlock concentrated on it. Magistro sat and helped him to focus, using his powers of a dream to amplify the effects. Warlock began to understand more about the reasoning behind this curious result. He could see more of the object. Its inner structure was presenting itself bare before his eyes. Information about the simple iron pan was coming to him in such a robust and continuous stream that it could overflow a sea. This continued as the dream world iron pan completely turned itself inside out and returned to its original form. He had progressed to Riddicon 3 with the thing. It was then that Warlock understood this object in its entirety. Many might think that a chunk of iron such as this did not have a need to be explored. However, if Warlock had left this unexamined, how much more would he misunderstand items of a more complex nature? He thought to himself, How interesting that this was revealed to me. Now I shall expand this into a more complex description. The pen has been explained with a lot of information. Warlock became in tune with the matter in its most basic form, and he could relate to something as expendable as an iron pan. Magistro spoke through the mind of Warlock. 
Explain to me the nature of this object. You will leave no details untold, for you understand and are grateful. You will know how to change it to suit your purposes. Warlock spoke to Magistro in his mind. Even in its stoic silence it speaks. Many words it wishes to share are not heard with the ears. One must be in an exact nature, in such harmony with a simple form, that they can understand the fundamentals. Nothing is as trivial as the fuller world may think. The simplest pen, even the most straightforward stone, can describe more about a complex individual than one can imagine, or even begin to describe. People are trapped in darkness when they do not contemplate something such as this. They are cheating themselves out of a valuable prize that anyone can claim if they choose. Even the pen speaks. Not words, not emotions, not even assumptions, but with an underlying sense of being. This pen has a presence and consciousness, and even that makes it more worthwhile than can be defined. Its presence is explosive and radiance in the discoveries it reveals. Know that the human spirit can shine brighter in being able to control such lowly forms as this. Though many people do not care to understand these forms, much will be taught by those who do. Knowledge of this will be brought to completion by those who have the power to speak, the insight to understand, and the heart to listen to what is told them. Warlock grasped the iron pan with the energy in his mind, and the pan presented itself with a radiance that he never experienced before. He wanted to learn more, thus more was taught. He spread his consciousness within this pan and allowed his energy to fill every crack and crevice. It harmonized with Warlock, with the resonance that would soon become his signature. Suddenly, a shockwave split the night as the Riddicon three pan shattered, with a blast that shook Warlock to his heart and forced Warlocks and the Pan's essences into Riddicon IV. His consciousness tugged at each radiant fragment of the Pan and pulled them into a perfect spherical shape. An iron ball was formed. Warlock forced it down to a sphere the size of an apple before halting his pressure on the mass. The iron ball shone bright, silver, and all rusty imperfections disappeared. Warlock grasped the shiny ball within his hand and caressed it. He injected his energy into the ball, giving part of his essence to this object. In a sense, he gave life to an inanimate object. Warlock had enough spirit to do the same with every iota of substance in his Riddicon IV, representation of Valexano if he so chose. However, he felt a particular fondness for this object that he had not felt before. This iron ball represented the physical matter that made up his physical body, similar to the water in Sentinel Lake, giving life. He closed his mental eyes and, holding the iron ball firmly, went further to the edge of Riddicon IV. Warlock walked contently towards Sentinel Lake and stopped at the sight of its waters. Finding the gold he had created from his prior visit to his lake, he reached in with his free hand and held the gold object with his left hand and the iron object with his right hand. He focused on the iron object, zooming into every particle until the single speck of his vision represented every part of the iron ball. Warlock used part of the brilliant gold's energy and brought it towards the iron sphere. This brought about a very warm and comforting feeling with the warmth, the surface changed on the iron ball. Smoothly, the gold's energy flowed over the surface of the iron-like water and penetrated more in depth into the ball. The iron became silver. As Warlock opened his eyes and proceeded back to Riddicon III, he continued to grasp the gold and silver, pulling them closer to his physical world. Gold represented the day and silver the night. Gold was the feeling of warmth, and silver the coolness of the water. Gold was the spirit, and silver the strength. Gold was spiritual, and silver was physical. Both an essential part of a broader realm of understanding. His spiritual and physical senses had been separate until now. 
existing in two very different worlds. Now he held both worlds and experiences within the palm of each hand. He kept them firm and closed his eyes. Moving them together slowly, he could feel the opposing forces, their attractive force drawing them near to one another, and at the same time the weaker repellent force that had beforehand kept them separate. Energy shot back and forth from one to the other. The spiritual and physical counterparts of his existence were being blended into one another. He felt his conscious being poured into the very center of where these energies met. Gold and silver energy, covering all possibilities, were being sealed together by his own creation, by his own conscience. Magistro, still in the physical world, saw reddish-yellow sparks shoot violently from the iron pan, knowing that something indeed magical and special was happening. The force between the silver and gold became very strong, yet Warlock's conscience allowed these spheres to approach one another slowly. These energies slowly touched and created an explosive force contained in a precise field. The physical pan instantaneously vanished with nothing more than a sharp flash, with all the power pulled back into itself within a single moment. This left nothing behind of the skillet in Quemzon, but the sound which resembled a sledgehammer striking an anvil. The gold and silver merged into one form as one body with colors that crossed all hues. Its weight seemed non-existent, rather like the weight of air, and it floated wherever it was placed. It was of a spiritual and physical nature, and was, in essence, everything Warlock knew. Warlock held all his wisdom in his hand. He felt multiple existences, for his presence seemed to encompass everything, yet he did not understand it fully. Only the amorcus tree of his destiny showed him a true wisdom the power revealed. Just then, his focus was concentrated on a figure that took hold of his sphere. This being was the power himself, the creator and dreamer of Valexano. The power spoke. You have proven your worth. You have surpassed your teacher in wisdom and discerning. You have been able to use both silver and gold efficiently. I give you a name for this creation, a creation that has everything in a finite form and will provide you with the wisdom to find your Riddicon 5. You shall refer to this invention as the Gamma Sphere, which begins the Gamma Gold generation. This generation will believe in what you will teach, and they will form the reality. It is your creation and thus a descendant of mine. The new generation has been spawned. Use it efficiently and appropriately, for you have achieved the discerning of every man and woman in Quemzon. Warlock, you have a name, yet unknown to you, that suits you and your plan for this world. Your new name envelops that which you have created, enhanced by your own true form. Your name will be spoken when all people have heard your words and have chosen your way. Now you possess the Gamma Sphere, which gives you insight into the hidden depths of your knowledge, revealing what you do not realize. Learn to use it, for all your knowledge can be searched within its endless and simultaneously finite bounds. Warlock closed his eyes and focused his consciousness on the Gamma Sphere, appearing at once in Quemzon. He exclaimed to Magistro, I have created the Gamma Sphere.